by Kullervo, who already possesses some kind of ill-defined uh, but very, very powerful magical uh, powers. Uh, and he can't be killed. Okay, go on to the next slide and we'll find out what happens. Okay. Untimo kill, sells, sells Kulervo to the smith Asimo, thus parting him from Wanona, and that's important. Uh, that's an important plot element as the story develops. The smith's wife, in a cruel insult, bakes a stone into his lunchtime bread. When his father's knife breaks on the stone, Kulervo's rage boils over. He enchants wolves and bears in the shape of cows and leads them to the barn, where they attack and kill the smith's wife. So by now his magic powers are um, very much in place, and he is quite comfortable with them. Kulervo now sets off to avenge his father's death. By the way, has anybody spotted the, um, the relationship to Hamlet? The two brothers, one kills the other. The son is resentful. He keeps trying to kill the murderer, but starts putting it off. Anyway, this is the gem, uh, the germ of, uh, of the story of Hamlet, which was kind of widespread in, uh, in Northwestern Europe. Okay, so on the way to avenge his father's death, he meets, without either of them recognizing the other, his sister, from whom he has been so long separated. He half rapes, half seduces her, uh, but apparently is successful and wins her affection. And when he reveals that he is son of Kalervo, she, seeing the truth, throws herself over a waterfall. Kalervo, at that point, with old knowledge, that's Tolkien's phrase, begins to suspect who she is, but he doesn't want to know. That's the point at which Tolkien's narrative <laughs> breaks off. That's where he put the pencil down. And uh, it's a very frustrating point because the story has gained enormous momentum and the reader is very much engaged with Kullervo and the anguish that he's starting to feel. Uh, but the story continues in outline and here's what happens. Kullervo does finally avenge his father's death by slaughtering Untamo and all his household, forgetting that that includes um, his mother um, and two other brothers and sisters, which he doesn't mention, accidentally killing his mother and burning the homestead. In a dream, he then visits his mother in the underworld, where she confirms that the maiden on the mountain, the one that he met, was his sister. In despair, Kullervo asks his sword if it will kill him. And it is happy to agree. It says, I've killed better people than you. You deserve the death. Yes, I will kill you. And he falls on his sword. And Tolkien's last line is, he kills himself and finds the death he sought for. This is a story. Can we have the next slide, Carl? So we, I can keep up with it. This is a story that is reeks with gloom and doom. There's nothing good that happens anywhere in it. It's got uh, mass murder, abduction, child abuse, rape, incest, arson, uh, just everything negative that you can possibly think about. And it doesn't at first seem to sort well with what most people know about Tolkien. People who have read The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings don't want to recognize their favorite author in this apparently untypical story. Um, so what we're going to be looking at from here on is where did this come from? What 
impelled Tolkien to go to this story, to pick this story to be his very first serious venture into a lot of different literary modes. Prose, up to then he had been a poet. Um, adaptation, because he's taking an existing source and reworking it. Um, myth retelling or myth making and tragedy because there's not a ray of light in this story anywhere but all of these genres that Tolkien is trying to jam together um, were his first ventures into this kind of literature okay so where did it come from one answer is it was always there. And why did Tolkien write it? And my answer is for the same reason, because it was always there. But then to where and why, I want to add a concluding who to see where we can find Kullervo in other characters in Tolkien's canon. So we will move now to the next slide and try to begin answering the questions. So we've come to where. And the external answer to the where question, where did it come from, is from Kalevala, the Finnish national epic, which has the very first and the most famous um, version of the story of Kullervo. Now, Kalevala, as probably most of you know, is a collection of early oral folk tales that was transcribed and published uh, by Elias Lundrot in the early 19th century. Lundrot was a Finn who was afraid that his country's oral culture was disappearing, and so he set out to record it and preserve it. Um, the 1849 edition, which is called The Kalevala, he published a, an earlier one called The Old Kalevala, which is shorter. Um, but the 1849 was translated into English and published in 1907 by W.H. Kirby. Tolkien read it in 1911, not too long after it came out, while he was a student at King Edward School in Birmingham. But here's the importance of it. Kalevala was dynamite for the Finns because they had been under the thumb of either Russia or Sweden, which were the two bordering countries, um, for about 400 years. And Kalevala gave them an identity. It gave them a myth of their own. Okay the well-known trope that Tolkien wanted to create a mythology for England found an echo in Lonrot's desire to preserve a mythology for Finland and thus, in a sense, create Finland as a nation because in the 19th century there was a great movement to rediscover nationalism in mythology. Uh, so the two elements, Tolkien and Kalevala, came together at just the right time. And Tolkien loved it, even in what he called Kirby's poor translation. He gave a talk to an Oxford society on its unhypocritical, scandalous heroes. Uh, for the most part, it's a very funny mythology. The one very serious part of it is the story of Kullervo, and it's not, it's not unimportant that that's the story that Tolkien gravitated to. So he read it in 1911 when he went up to Oxford in 1912. He actually tried to teach himself Finnish so he could read it in the original on the principle that he was then evolving that a story and its language, its original language, are inseparable and that to fully appreciate the story 
you have to know the language. You have to understand the words. So that's where it came from in a sort of outside source. Carl, next slide, please. And anybody who has questions can interrupt at any time if they want to. Uh, OK, now the next question is why external? Uh, not where, which was Kalevala, but how come? And I've already sort of started on answering this question by explaining the impact that Kalevala had on Tolkien. It opened a whole new world to him. It wasn't just a mythology. It was a whole new mythology. He'd read Greek. He'd read Roman. He'd read Norse. Uh, he'd read Germanic. He'd read Irish. But Kalevala was not one of those old war horses that everybody in Western Europe already knew. Kalevala was brand new and fresh and very different. Uh, its heroes <laughs> were rogues. Um, they were liars and cheats and scammers. Uh, they had no consciences uh, except to have a good time. Um, so Tolkien really entered into this. And what you've got now is a sort of one-two punch of the joy of Kalevala and these scandalous heroes. Uh, and the darkness of the one particular story about Kullervo. But what Tolkien loved, above all, was the feeling of estrangement. This was a place he'd never been before. He compared it to landing on a new continent, like discovering America. Uh, it was a new world to him, and it taught him the value of alienation, in a sense, as a necessary component of creating a whole new secondary world, which was what he wanted to do with his mythology. Um, and there's also actual hard textual evidence um, on the manuscript of the story of Kullervo that suggests that this story, whose characters he loved, was also a story that triggered in him uh, a renewed desire to invent a language because some of the early, early names in the story of Kullervo that he jotted on the margins of the manuscript have been identified as proto-Elvish, the earliest footsteps in his language invention, which turned into the language of Quenya. So we got external where and external why. Now let's go to internal, if we may, Carl. The internal answer is from Tolkien's already developed vision of himself as a myth maker. That is where, in the internal sense, Kalevala came from because he's already thinking of himself as not just a poet, but as a maker of myths and a creator of secondary worlds. And he wrote in a letter to his fiancée, Edith Brath, um, that he was trying to turn one of the stories of Kalevala, which is really, he said, a very great story and most tragic into a short story somewhat on the lines of Morris's romances with chunks of poetry in between. So it's a mixture of prose and poetry. Now, he was nothing if not ambitious and already um, lining himself up with some pretty heavy duty myth makers and, uh, and writers, thinking of himself as working the same territory as William Morris who was one of the biggies of the 19th century, as Tolkien well knew, and also William Shakespeare. Uh, for this very great story is indeed, as I told you, the very great story of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, and Tolkien knew it. There was a lot of scholarship coming out, coincident with the story of Kullervo uh, in Kalevala, uh, in which Icelandic and um, 
philological scholars were already noticing the similarities and tracing the story of Hamlet, which is very sophisticated, high Renaissance, uh, full of introspection, all the way back to the primitive story of Kullervo and even farther back into Danish and Irish history. So that's where it came from internally. It was just suffused with myth. And Tolkien was a sucker for myth. So the next slide, please. OK, now the why, the internal answer to why, is that this story spoke very deeply to the young man that Tolkien was at the time he discovered it. He and Kullervo had some very important things in common. One was the loss of a father at a very young age. Uh, not quite <laughs> prenatal, but Tolkien's father, Arthur Tolkien, died in Africa of rheumatic fever while Tolkien, who was not quite four, was visiting family in England. So his father disappeared from his life at a very, very early age. He had almost no memories of him. So that's one thing. Estrangement from extended family. Tolkien's mother converted to Catholicism when he was a young boy, and that put her on the outs with her strongly Protestant family. And you have to remember that to be a Catholic in England is still not an easy thing. It goes all the way back to Henry VIII, the split with Rome, uh, all kinds of persecutions and martyrs. Uh, but to be Catholic is still to be a little bit of an outsider. And um, Tolkien felt that. Uh, his mother was on her own. Uh, she was a single mom with no help from family. OK, I've got a question coming in from Kate Neville. Hi, Kate. Um, do I know where this effort falls in relation to the last meeting of the TCBS in London? All right, that last meeting was, I think, in 1914 or 1915. I'm not going to break now to look it up, so I'm kind of winging it. But I believe that was uh, the last meeting before those guys all went off to war, which they did in 1916. Um, the window for Tolkien's composition of the story of Kullervo goes from his reading it for the first time, 1911, let's say 1912, when he tries to learn Finish to uh, some scholars take it all the way to 1916 when he went off to war, but there's no evidence that he worked on it very much after 1914. So I would say that it just precedes the uh, last meeting, that last meeting of the TCBS, but that's a guess. I don't have any concrete evidence for that. It's a good question. OK, so loss of father, estrangement. He was a stranger in a strange land. And then death of the mother. Tolkien's mother died when he was 12. Now, there's no, no good time to lose your mother or any parent. But 12 is a very tricky age. It's right on the threshold of adolescence. You're feeling eager and excited. You're um, vulnerable. You don't quite know who you are. The world is opening up. And to lose the parent, because she was the only one by that time, is a terrible blow. What this does is it makes Tolkien an orphan, a cast out, uh, an alien in his own world. And these are all of them things that would resonate with what he was reading in the story of Kullervo, who gets all of that and more 
dumped on him. So I'm suggesting there was a personal as well as a uh, professional uh, motive for Tolkien in being attracted to this story. I don't want us to read the story of Kullervo as Tolkien's thinly disguised autobiography. I'm not selling that, not at all. But I do want to suggest very strongly that he was drawn to it for very personal reasons. Okay, Carl, on to the next slide. I've got a question from Greg Knight. Let me get this one slide under our belts first, Greg, and then I'll turn to your question, okay? I'm putting a quote here. This is more why, because this is a long quote from Tolkien's first and best biographer, Humphrey Carpenter, uh, who said, the loss of his mother had a profound effect on his personality. It made him into a pessimist. Or rather, it made him into two people. He was by nature a cheerful, almost irrepressible person with a great zest for life. That's what drew him to Kalevala in the first place, was all those scandalous heroes. He loved good talk and physical activity. He had a deep sense of humor and a great capacity for making friends. But from now on, that is the death of the mother, there was to be a second side, more private but predominant in his diaries and letters. This side of him was capable of bouts of profound despair. When he was in this mood, he had a deep sense of impending loss. Nothing was safe. Nothing would last. No battle would be won forever. Okay, two quotes to keep in mind right now. The one I opened with about using writing to express your feelings and Carpenter's quote about the, the break that the death of his mother caused in Tolkien's personality. Okay, Greg Knight, question. Tolkien's early dark writings are so different from the works published in his lifetime. Are they really? I wonder. To continue so different from the works published in his lifetime, and aside from the Silmarillion, he didn't resume dabbling in those roots. Again, I'm going to question that. What do you suppose eventually drew him in a different thematic direction? Perhaps fatherhood? Okay, Greg, this is a great question, and it is coming at the perfect time, because we're both right. Um, these are very, very dark writings, these early things. Um, and they, they're jarring when what you know is the Jolly Hobbits, food and drink, walking songs, furry feet, um, the, the wonderfulness of the world that Tolkien created in The Lord of the Rings, uh, and even in the Silmarillion. Um, I'm going to suggest that there's a dark element in those books, the ones we've all read, and that reading them in the light of the story of Kullervo, of Tolkien Dark, and later of Atru and Itrun, may bring out more nuances in those stories than, uh, than we usually see. Okay? Uh, now, what drew him to a different thematic direction? The other side of the personality. The cheerful, irrepressible person with the great zest for life, which is certainly where he found hobbits. A great capacity for making friends. The Lord of the Rings is, in a sense, all about friendship. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that we've been enchanted by one side of Tolkien and we need to 
run the balance a little bit by seeing that it's the other side, the dark side, the shadow side, that actually brings out the enchantment and throws it into relief, and that they're both there. So, very, very good questions. Um, now, Carl, if you could sneak us along to the next slide. Okay. Why, more why, still more why. When Tolkien's mother died, he and his brother, Hillary, were farmed out to relatives who were not particularly welcoming. And they were finally placed in a boarding house. So, like Kullervo, Tolkien lost the only home that he knew, which was all tied up with his mother, who was, of course, the homemaker. Um, she had appointed a guardian, uh, a priest, Father Francis Morgan, who looked after the boys as best he could, but he couldn't exactly give them a home. Uh, he was a celibate priest, and he lived in an oratory. He made provisions for them. He tried to find places for them, but it wasn't home. And Tolkien felt cast out. More than that, uh, he had no money. Uh, he had to get a scholarship to Oxford. Uh, on finishing, he was going to have to make his own way, be on his own. So again, like Kullervo, uh, he felt kind of solitary in the universe. Uh, he later, in the essay on fairy stories actually, referred to this period in his life as really a sad and troubled time. Well, that's all he ever said about it. Or at least that's all that's in print. So we've got to fill in from what we know externally of the circumstances what it must have been like to be a 12-year-old, 13, 14, 15-year-old uh, with no home, no parents, uh, estranged from relatives, essentially on your own except for a very kind guardian, uh, now there's no uh, there's no smith to enslave him. There's no smith's wife to bake stones into his bread. We're not going there. But it must have been. It cannot help but have been a traumatic time for a young boy right on the threshold of manhood. And it was at that time, with these events still fresh and his grief and his anger still raw, that he began the story of Kullervo. Sometime between 1912 and 1915, his one concrete reference to it is in a letter in 1914. So that's the date we have to hang on to. Okay. Oh, I've got more questions coming in. Tom Hillman says, good evening. Okay, and Kate Neville says, Thorondor dies and Frodo falls short. Yes, exactly. That's my point. You're making it for me. Good. Um, well, Thorin. <laughs> yeah, I was worried about Thorondor, but yeah, Thorin dies. You're right. You're seeing it. There are elements in The Hobbit, and not just Thorin, that are much darker than the whole sort of surface fairy tale uh, leads you to believe. Now, Tony Meads says the idea of Tolkien the pessimist reminds me of that line about how the shadow always returns after a defeat and a respite and takes a new form. Tony, you got it. That's it exactly. And, of course, as we all know, you are quoting Tolkien. Uh, and that's what Humphrey Carpenter saw. Nothing was safe. No battle would be won forever. The shadow would always return. 
Okay, now Andrew Higgins is weighing in and says, I've been looking at some of the adjectives that Tolkien invented in the Quenya and Gnomish lexicons, and there seem to be many more words to describe sadness, gloom, and darkness. That's very interesting. Great. I love it when people's disciplines dovetail and interject. And Andy's working on language. An evolving idea, but may show this reflection of darkness in his language invention. I think it does. And I think that's a fascinating detail. That the, the balance was weighted heavily in his language for words describing sadness, gloom, and darkness. Okay, I think we are off to a fine start. Um, now, unless I have any no more questions at this time. So let's get on with it and go on to the next slide, please. Okay, well, we've already, in a sense, you guys are ahead of me, which is great. Uh, we've started addressing the problem before I had introduced it. Uh, but the problem is that this is not what most people see in Tolkien. Um, mayhem, murder, abduction, child abuse, slavery, incest, arson, suicide doesn't evoke the author who invented hobbits and furry feet. And that's the problem because hobbits have cast their mellow and joyous glow over a story that Tolkien actually described to his publisher as bitter and very terrifying. He meant the Lord of the Rings. But underneath the glow, the dark elements are still there, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to see them a little more clearly. Uh, you've brought up, Kate, you brought up Thorin in The Hobbit, and he's just the tip of the iceberg. The Hobbit begins as a children's story with Bilbo on the doorstep and the comic dialogue with Gandalf, but halfway through, it shifts to a much wider and much darker story that's no longer fairy story, uh, Bilbo's theft of the Arkenstone, Thorin's greed, the world war that is the battle of five armies, and culminating, again, I hats off to you, Kate, the Thorin's death, which I find the most poignant and, and moving moment in the book. It makes me cry, uh, which is hard when I used to read it to my children. Um, now, The Lord of the Rings, as everybody knows, started out as a children's story because it was going to be the new Hobbit. But he couldn't keep it that way. Just like The Hobbit, but much, much earlier, it started sliding into that darker world. And by chapter two, the shadow of the past. He has moved on to murder, obsession, corruption, moral relativism, betrayal, sacrifice, and another world war, which is what takes up the rest of the story. Um, so if you look from the perspective of the story of Kullervo forward at the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, instead of looking backward from those two books at the story of Kullervo, I think you'll see much more continuity. I think you'll see that really there is a straight line that you can draw from this very, very early story, which has all the gloom and doom you could ever want, um, to the much more two-toned, much more uh, profound uh, light and dark treatment of those two other books. Okay, Tony, uh, oh no, Tom says, Turin and Tom Bombadil both have deep roots in Kalevala. Yes, we're going to get to Turin, I hope. Um, Turin is dark. Tom is bright, says Tom. One wretched, one blissful, one mastered by fate, one the master. What does it say about Tolkien's relationship to the Kalevala that he drew on it 
for two so widely different and memorable characters. Okay, um, Carl, can we get back to Carpenter's quote just for a minute so I can refresh everybody's mind? Uh, in the notion that his mother's death made him into two people, you guys are starting to see in the works those two people, which is just what I hoped and dreamed would happen. Against Turin, you've got Tom. Uh, against an outcast, you've got a man who rules his country or guards it. Uh, one is wretched, one is blissful, one is mastered, one is the master. Uh, well, I think, no, I know for a fact that Tolkien got almost all of Tom Bombadil right out of Kalevala. Not from Kullervo, but from one of the other scandalous heroes, from Vainamoinen, who is described as the eternal singer and who can enchant people with his song. Uh, he's actually called a Tiyataya. That's the only Finnish I know, uh, which means a knower. And Tom knows everything about Middle Earth. Tom can go back into uh, the past before the, the hobbits even came on the scene. Tom remembers things, and that links him to Vainamoinen. Um, so, yeah, everybody should now go out and read Kalevala, if you have it already. Uh, first of all, to get the joy that Tolkien got out of it, and second, to see what else Tolkien might have gotten. Now, Tony says Tolkien even undermines the cheery idea of hobbits by making Smeagol Gollum originate as a kind of hobbit. Tony, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> That's what I'm going to be talking about. How all of this that's packed and compressed into this one dark story kind of blossomed darkly, I agree, uh, into so much in The Lord of the Rings, into characters that we now can recognize as having uh, a greater depth uh, and a greater relief, because there's a way in which Gollum has two sides, as we all know, Slinker and Stinker. Okay, Carl, can we get to, I guess we're on slide 9 or 10 now? 11, please. So, let's go back and start all over again. Who then is Kullervo? Uh, if you just look at him, uh, he's nobody you would ever want to meet at a party. Tolkien, in the story, describes him as resentful, morose, violent, ill-favored, bitter, crooked, broad, ungainly, ill-net, and naughty, and unrestrained, and unsoftened. Uh, so he's not attractive, not at all. Uh, you just won't, you don't want to run into him if you saw him coming. You'd cross the street to the other side. Now, I would add to Tolkien's litany, angry, resentful, which Tolkien does say, grudge-holding, stubborn, vengeful, self-pitying. Uh, so he's got a lot of negative emotions. Andy, I'm wondering how many Kenya words there are for resentful, morose, violent, ill-favored, uh, stubborn, vengeful, and self-pitying. Um, just a kind of a side there. Um, but he is, and I really mean this, he is the ancestor of some of Tolkien's greatest characters, and everybody recognizes Turin Turambar. Uh, Tony just recognized Gollum. And I would like to add to that um, Frodo, who comes also directly out of Kullervo. Okay. Uh, Kate 
says Tom Bombadil has the moment when he finds the brooch and is reminded of something sad. Yes, fair was she who wore this on her shoulder. Um, we will keep this brooch and, and we, we, Tom will give it to Goldberry and we will not forget her. Yeah. Okay, another one. You're seeing Ale, the Dark Elf. Yes. And who is angry, resentful, morose, uh, abusive, which Kullervo is not, although you could, I guess, call killing the Smith's wife abusive. Um, but he's the seed uh, of all of these characters. Um, like one of those one of those flowers that you used to be able to get in the drugstore that's all compact and you pour water on it and it starts suddenly and within your um, vision to just begin to, to sprout. And that's what Tolkien's imagination did uh, with Colervo uh, when he came after the war to revisit his very, very incipient mythology, which he had intended for England. He had written two poems, uh, The Voyage of Arundel and The Shores of Fairy, all about stars in the sky and going to another land. And they were pretty, pretty 19th century poetic, intensely romantic. Um, and that was as far as he'd gotten on the mythology, except for the languages, when he went off to war. It's when he came back, and we can't ignore the very real possibility that his war experience reinforced that dark side of him that he had recognized in Kullervo. Um, that he began to write prose, not just to compose poetry. It wasn't until 1917 that he first wrote uh, the, uh, the Defense of Gondolin, uh, and that was clearly something that derived directly out of his war experience, <clears throat> but I'm suggesting was also colored by um, by all the things that he had wanted to write and hadn't. Um, I think he said, didn't he, uh, about the last meeting, Kate, that there were all sorts of pent-up things that uh, the four members of the TCBS uh, engendered in him or released in him. Um, so I think you're quite right in honing in on that last meeting as, as a kind of a jumping off place for much that was to come later. All right, Tony says, I can't help being reminded of Feanor. Listen, the list, Turin, Frodo, and Gollum, could have been much, much longer. Of course, Feanor, Boromir, certainly elements of Denethor. Uh, Tolkien's world is peopled with people who are light and dark, not some people light and some people dark, which is the way that a lot of simplistic critics chose to read it. Simple tale of good and evil, all that. Uh, but with people who are within themselves, light and dark, uh, who are divided. Boromir is certainly divided, uh, and tragically so. He has a different ending from Kullervo, but he certainly um, has also some of Kullervo's characteristics. Um, Kate has come in with a comment 
I remember him leaving, that is leaving the last meeting of the TCBS, the Council of London, convinced he was a poet. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, he never abandoned that side of him. Uh, and poetry flowed out of him all of his life. And remember that the story of Kullervo was supposed to be along the lines of Morris romances with chunks of poetry in between. Uh, and that's another way in which the whole of Kalevala um, influenced him uh, because the Lord of the Rings certainly has chunks of poetry in between. A lot of people skip them, um, but they're there and they're meant to reinforce the prose. So he really, in a way, he kind of saw himself as a combination between Kenneth Morris and Elias Lonrot. Uh, not just composing, but preserving these fragments of the mythology that he was actually creating. Okay, uh, Joyce Sturgill is weighing in. <clears throat> Hi Joyce, I haven't met you, I don't think, but hello. And she says, the progression of decay, of entropy, of the gnawing away at the roots of the world tree, show from the heights of the creation, from the music of the Ainur to the harsh verses of the goblins of the Hobbit, the mood is one of decay. Yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, I'm thinking, and I'll bet you are too, of the conversation between Gimli and Legolas when they finally go into Minas Tirith and they're talking about the works of men. Uh, and Legolas says, not enough trees. And Gimli says, yeah, and their stonework could use a little work. But they also both talk about the fact that the works of men never really come to fruition. They they start out well, and yet something always happens to them. Uh, so I think that that's, uh, in a way, kind of a a little meme for uh, for the whole book. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, now the gnawing away at the roots of the world tree that sounds to me more like Edda than like the Lord of the Rings. Uh, have you read Edda, and are you referring to that too? Just shoot me an email and say yes, then I will know. Okay, so we've got these characters. I'll try to fit them all in, but I'm going to start with Turin, <clears throat> go to Gollum, and then to Frodo. So, Carl, the next slide. All right, so here we go, and I'm starting with Turin to Rambar. You have already noticed that this very same tone pervades the Silmarillion, and of course it does much more than the Lord of the Rings, because it doesn't have any hobbits. The Silmarillion is the story of defeat. It's the long defeat. Uh, nothing good will last. No battle will be won forever. And in the Silmarillion, no battle ever is. But Turin to Rambar is the direct, immediate outcome of Tolkien's work on the story of Kullervo. Uh, anybody who has read the one will recognize in the other all the, all the right ingredients. Absent parents, exile, lost sister, fate, incestuous encounter, double suicide, even the dialogue with the sword. I mean, he took that right out of the story of, Kul of Kalevala, put it first in his own story of Kullervo, and then took it entire and put it in the story of Turin. It was like there was something in that moment that affected him very profoundly, uh, the notion of contemplating suicide. So, it is Tolkien's Kullervo also who gave Turin his vivid personality 
because Turin's contrariness. I mean, there are times when you want to simply hit Tolkien over the ears for being such a stubborn, wrong-headed idiot. Every decision he can possibly make wrong, he does. Ah, uh, so <clears throat> it's from Colervo that he gets that propensity. Uh, it's from Colervo that he gets his anger, his touchiness, the chip on his shoulder, the readiness to be offended, uh, to hear an insult. Um, now, that's what gives him his bite. And I've always wondered myself if Tolkien didn't, much as he loved the story of Beren and Luthien, realize that Middle-earth needed a darker hero. Uh, because Beren is very much a fairy tale hero. He has bad moments, but his personality uh, is that of the fairy tale adventurer who goes into the enchanted world and, uh, and changes things. Um, and Colervo is so different. Uh, Colervo stands out so much from that fairy tale paradigm uh, that I think he is a nice, in a sense, I'm going to say this very carefully, he is a nice corrective to Baron. Um, because the story of Baron and Luthien is a fairy tale and a romance. And the story of Turin Turambar comes from much darker stuff. It's epic and it's tragic. And he came, um, and I'm sorry, not Colorbo, Turin uh, is epic and tragic. Okay, uh, so I think we're on to the next slide, if we can. I'm not neglecting anybody, am I? Oh, Joyce agrees with me. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at Gollum and see what we can find replicated uh, in Gollum that we see and already have seen in Colorvo. Um, I'm going to throw you a challenge. Send me some characteristics that you see in Kullervo that you can recognize in Gollum. Just type in a name, anybody who wants to. Um, I'll start. <laughs> Gollum is an outsider, a misfit. He's angry. He has a grudge against the world. He goes a little crazy when he loses his one treasure. Uh, I'm not really equating the ring and Kullervo's father's knife, but um, desecration of a possession is certainly there in both of them. Okay, nothing coming in? I'm going to have to do this all myself? I thought surely you would start to see things in Gollum, who, by the way, is one of my favorite characters. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll forge ahead then. Tolkien's most psychologically complex character, and I am including Frodo and Boromir and Denethor, is very much like Kullervo and more like Turin than you might suppose. Uh, and he is also a portent, of course, of what Frodo could become. But um, he's kicked out of his home. He's forced to wander lonely through the world. Kullervo, as you know, has a long, one of the chunks of poetry in which he says to the creator, why did you make me? Who in the world created me? This poor little, um, I think he calls him um, a seagull. I'm looking for it. Okay. 
Wherefore have I been created? Who has made me and has doomed me? Now this is Kulervo, not Gollum. Thus neath sun and moon to wander, neath the open sky forever. Others to their homes may journey that stand twinkling in the even. But my home is in the forest. In the wind halls must I slumber, and in bitter rain must bathe me. And my hearth is midst the heather, in the wide halls of the wind blast, in the rain and in the weather. Well, that sure sounds like Gollum to me. Then he says, never Yumala, that's the God figure. Um, most holy, in these ages of the ages, form a child thus crooked, fated, with a friendless doom forever, to go fatherless neath heaven and uncared for by any mother, as thou, Yumala, have made me, like a wailing, wandering seagull, like a sea mew in the weather, haunting misty rocks and shore limbs, while the sun shines on the swallow, and the sparrow has its brightness, and the birds of air are joyous. But that is never happy. That refers all the way back to the me that he says Yumala should not have made. I, Sari, am not happy. O oh, Ilu, life is joyless. And then our four lines that he wrote and then crossed out. I was small and lost my mother. Then mother is crossed out, and he wrote in father. I was young, and then he writes weak, and lost my mother. All my mighty race has perished. All my mighty race. That's Tolkien's Kullervo. Um, but it certainly could be Gollum any time. Okay, I've got some words coming in. Kate Neville says abuse. Tony Mead says self-pity, blame-shifting. Kate Neville says ugly. Tim Fisher says he came in late. <laughs> uh, is Kullervo like Gollum conflicted? Uh, actually only about killing um, Untamo. But in that respect, he is because he keeps putting it off. Brenton Dickinson says both Gollum and Kullervo have a strange relationship, oh good, with childhood and time. Hey, I like that. Gollum is very old and a child. Kullervo is a child and ages quickly. Very good. There's something going on there. I, you, you can do some more with that, Britain. Uh, Don Standing says, outsider, angry misfit, and recommends Grima and... <laughs> Sauron. All right. Well, not so let's not stop at Sauron. Let's go for Morgoth as well, who was cast out. Uh, now we're beginning to see how the more you know, the more you know. How the texture is starting to thicken and deepen and, uh, and all the, the shadows and lights are coming out. Okay, Tony says, commits crimes and sees himself as the victim. You bet. And, by the way, so does Turin. He's, uh, he's no innocent. He causes some havoc. Uh, brooding like Saruman, says Wynne Martin. Yes, I think so. Um, sitting alone and, in a sense, sulking, which Saruman does. Yeah. And somebody earlier said something about worm tongue. Where was that? I'm missing it. But anyway, it's there. Uh, yeah. And now we're beginning to see that Tolkien's palette has a lot of dark shades to go along with the light ones. And that his cast of characters is multifarious. Um, there's a huge range of personalities and individuals within his stories, and many of them have this mixture uh, of light and dark, of the, the tension 
the the pull between the two of them. Um, okay, here's another question, Tim Fisher. A bit off topic, but I hear some parallels between Kullervo and Tristan, the Arthurian hero. Okay, fatherless, plagued by grief. Yeah, Tristan is not an outsider. No, he's almost too much of an insider. Um, now. This is not unusual in medieval literature because people died young. So lots of people lost parents uh, and were cast out. Uh, and a lot of particularly early medieval literature, and especially the Icelandic and the Germanic, um, have characters who express exactly these feelings uh, of being cast out on a, on a kind of hostile world. Um, so to get to the bottom of slide 13, it's kind of like Tolkien felt compelled to keep retelling from different angles the same, remember he called it a very great story, uh, but one that fascinated him all his life uh, because it could open out into so much. But to oversimplify, and please do not quote me on this, it would be possible to say that Tolkien was writing the story of Kullervo over and over and over all the rest of his life. Now, I said don't quote me and don't you dare. Uh, because it isn't true of Smith, it isn't true of Farmer Giles, it isn't true of Mr. Bliss, it isn't true of Rover Random. You know, a lot of the children's stories are, are very happy. Um, but there's something also that pulls him to the dark side. And the powerful stories, not necessarily the jolly ones, are the ones that come out of Kullervo. Okay, I think we're getting toward the end. Uh, we may have a little extra time. I didn't quite know how long this was going to take, but I'd like to get to the next slide if we can, Carl. Okay, this one is my curveball. This is the one that I think is from left field uh, because I want to propose that Frodo Baggins, or at least some aspects of Frodo Baggins come out of the story of Kullervo. And I'll bet a cookie that if I were just to shut up now and keep mum, you could fill them in for me. And if you want to, if you want to start sending me one word descriptions of Kullervo, uh, you'll likely find me agreeing with you. Okay, Brenton Dickinson says, oh no, we're still on Kullervo. Uh, okay, we really still are on Kullervo, so Carl, could you go back just a minute? I Sorry, guys, I didn't see you. I didn't mean to, to cut anybody off. So Brenton says uh, both, that is, Gollum and Kullervo, have an impetuous mood that leads to fratricide. Gollum, his friend, and Kullervo, his family. Yes? Um, Gollum with uh, Deogol, very clearly, who is almost a brother, certainly a relative, and Kullervo inadvertently, because he is impetuous, you're absolutely right, um, kills off all the rest of his family. You betcha. Okay, so when Martin says, are you implying then that Kullervo was the bedrock of all despair and moral perversion that each character in the legendarium is prone to fall into. That is to say, Saruman and Denethor and Gollum. I would dodge your word bedrock um, because I'm not sure that Tolkien was consciously building on what he had laid down with Kullervo as a kind of foundation. 
I'm trying to waffle a little bit more than that and, and fudge, uh, to be honest about it, but to say that his work with Colervo taught him how to look for and to find and and bring alive the negative qualities that everybody has and that Tolkien was certainly very careful to build into his legendarium. Um, I hope that's a satisfactory answer when it's as honest a one as I can make but you're welcome to continue this discussion. Now Tony says, slightly off topic, what would you say is the difference between Tolkien's darkness and the darkness of other fantasy authors such as George R. R. Martin or Robert Howard, Game of Thrones or Conan? Is it a distinction between pessimism and cynicism or gratuitousness? I think that is a whopper of a question. I have to say that I have not read Game of Thrones. I tried it, uh, but it wasn't... I couldn't get into the world, um, so I'm not an authority on it. My understanding of it is that there's more cynicism in, uh, in George R. R. Martin. Um, and he certainly um, weights things very heavily on the dark side. Whereas what I'm trying to sell you on Tolkien is that the dark side is there to balance the bright side, which is unmistakably there as well. Um, Martin was riffing on the Wars of the Roses, which was a pretty complex, politically motivated time, uh, and the models on which he built his characters were not very nice people. Um, whereas Tolkien likes Boromir. Tolkien likes Gollum. And I think Tolkien liked Colervo. Um, there's a there's an affinity there that I see <clears throat> that softens that sort of George R. R. Martin bedrock. Okay, Kate says there are universal truths worth retelling. Who? It's the universal truths that are always worth retelling and again and again and again. Kate, I think you're going back to the bottom of slide 13 uh, and commenting on what I say there about Tolkien being compelled to keep retelling from different angles the same very great story. And you're saying there are universal truths worth retelling. Go, Kate. Yes. Right on. You are absolutely right. And I do think that Tolkien felt this was a universal truth. Here am I in the world. What do I make of it, says Colervo, Hamlet, Turin, Boromir, Gollum, uh, Wormtongue. All of them. Uh, and each of them has their very great story. Um, I'm tempted to let this slide over into a discussion of Beowulf, but I'm going to resist. Um, that, would, that would widen it a little bit too much, much as it would be fun. Okay, Andrew Higgins says, lost his father young. Who, Andy? Oh, Frodo lost his father young. Well, lost both parents, yes. Uh, but also, in a way, says Andy, Frodo is an interesting mixture, mixture of the Turin type and the Baron type, tragic and heroic. And in the end, 
he needs to leave, tragic, but found rest in tall Arisea before dying. Is Frodo a mixture of the two? Mm, that's an interesting question. I think he might very well be. Um, I don't see Frodo as heroic in the same way that Baron is heroic. Baron does a great deed. He has help, but he does a great deed. Frodo does a does not do a great deed, and that's the defining moment of his life. Um, so I wouldn't quite want to put them all together, Turin type and Baron type. And by the way, um, he goes to Valinor, doesn't he? Isn't that where the gray rain curtain rolls back and he sees a far green shore? Uh, Tolkien said that he went to the Undying Lands, um, not necessarily to find rest, but to find healing, if he could. Um, Frodo is a mixture, for sure. Now, somebody, Joyce is suggesting Martin gives us a world without redeeming features, and Howard's is fun. Okay, I'll let you have it, Joyce, because I think you've said it right. Uh, but you're also saying Gollum is Richard III. No. Richard III has no good side. Richard III is mean as hell and revels in it. When he is nice, he is pretending. And when he is mean and nasty, he is saying, look at me, see what I'm doing. Uh, Gollum is not that sophisticated. Uh, Gollum really does have a kind of sweet side um, that doesn't come out very often. Um, Kate says, between Colervo and Frodo, I see the main distinction to be one of free will. Frodo is an outcast and a man of sorrows, or made an outcast and a man of sorrows by the ring, but he takes that task freely, right? Might Frodo be a created Colervo rather than a born Colervo? That's a rather fine distinction. Um, you're comparing Frodo to Adam, I think. Uh, and Kullervo, uh to be someone without free will. Kate, this is such an interesting and exciting and complex question that I'm kind of scared to answer it. It goes too deep. Um, if you want to send me an email, uh, I'll be glad to get into this with you, but I, I'm afraid of getting in over my head uh, with regard to this one question, which since it brings up free will, opens uh, another whole hallway full of doors. Uh, so I'm going to dodge it. Okay. Andrew Higgins says, Frodo. Okay, Andrew's question was, uh, Andrew, what was your question? Oh dear, I've forgotten it. And Joyce says, tongue in cheek, I'm sorry. Um, I can't see your faces, so it's hard sometimes to know. Tony says, Frodo does do the great deed of even making it to Mount Doom, but ultimately the world is saved by grace rather than by deeds. Yes, and in a very psychologically complex method by having the one character who is unmotivated by grace at this point uh, be the instrument. Uh, talk about new catastrophe. Uh, 
a good catastrophe. That's the greatest one, I think, that has ever been written. Okay, well, we are moving along to the end of this class. Of course, we'll never say everything that is to be said, but uh, we only have five minutes left. So I'd like to go, Carl, if you will, to my next slide. Because uh, we've got to talk about Frodo a little bit. He's orphaned, adopted, exiled, suffers the loss of all he holds dear, um, and, uh, and ultimately has a ruined life. He does not ever, as Kullervo does say, who made me to be such a hard luck guy? Uh, so I'm not saying Frodo is Kullervo, but I am saying that there are dark aspects to his character especially the closer he gets to Mount Doom. Uh, when he turns on Sam in the Tower of Kirith Ungol, uh, when he sort of loses it and starts running across the bridge and Sam has to, to pull him back, uh, there are some terribly poignant, dark moments in Frodo that link him to Gollum, of course, and I think also to Kullervo. Okay, um, we've got to wrap it up, guys, so on to the next slide. Yeah, I want to get back to, um, to the quote that I started with. I think, said Tolkien, wrote Tolkien to Christopher, if you could begin to write, you would find it a great relief. I sense amongst all your pains the desire to express your feelings about good, evil, fair, foul, see how those things are balanced against one another, in some way to rationalize it and prevent it just festering. Uh, to me, that's the key to this whole thing. Tolkien did begin to write. I don't know how much of a relief he found it, but he certainly found it uh, a vocation um, and he was able to rationalize it. Now, I don't think he meant rationalize in the conventional modern sense of excuse, as in you're just rationalizing uh, what is really bad behavior. I think he could have break in the, broken the word into two. Rational eyes to try to make it rational, to take those feelings which are, of course, not rational, they are emotional, and make something rational out of them, to rationalize it and prevent it just festering. And I think for sure that Tolkien did that. Um, we've got, I think, two minutes left and got some questions coming in here. Okay, Tom Hillman says, Sam refuses to be Kullervo or Turin when he contemplates and rejects suicide. You're right. He does. And it's worth our noting that he both contemplates it and rejects it. But Tolkien has people play with the idea of suicide more than once in his stories. Kate Neville says, Smeagol needs a Sam. Exactly the kind of person who wouldn't be sympathetic, though, to a Smeagol? Yes, if he'd had... Well, you know, he almost gets one in Frodo. When he says, when they first meet, poor, poor Smeagol, he went away long ago. They took away his precious, and he's lost now. And Frodo says, perhaps we'll get him back if you come with us. Perhaps you can find him again. And he almost does. Okay. When Martin says, in touch with a larger theme of the whole Lord of the Rings, Frodo's darkness seems to be balanced out by his friends and companions. You bet. As was Tolkien's. Uh, friendship. Uh, Carpenter said he loved friends, friendship, and good cheer. The TCBS the coal biters, 
uh, the inklings, the four of the fellowship of the ring. He, he reveled in friendship. Um, and that's the one thing that Kullervo never has. Uh, so that's the one way in which the one-sidedness of Kullervo is not borne out in Tolkien's other works. So when Martin says that's what separates Frodo from Kullervo, yes, I would say so. Tony says, I always thought that Frodo end up, ended up much better off than he expected he would when he took on the burden of the ring. He thought he would never see the Shire again and he would die in the quest. In the end, he survived and was able to return to his home and eventually find some peace and healing. Yes, Tony, I... 89%, I agree with you. He does... He did think he was going to die, and he does get to go home. Um, but he can't stay there, um, because the Shire... He, because he's different from the Shire now. And, uh, and it's, he's like a, a guy coming back from Vietnam or uh, Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, he's wounded. He says it will never really heal and it isn't just the finger and the sting. Um, he's a different person and a much soberer one. Um, but he does find peace or healing when he goes abroad. Yes. Um, so, well, I think it's a good question. Are you better off dead or damaged? Tolkien knew both because one of his sons, uh, his second son, Michael, who was badly damaged in World War II, never really got over it like Frodo. And Tolkien described him as a much damaged soldier. So in a sense, he knew both sides. Uh, Joyce says, I find the imagery prevented just festering, similar to lancing a boil. Interesting. Yeah, festering is an interesting word, isn't it, for that? Almost like treating PTSD. Uh, get it up, get it out. Yeah, I think you're right. No question. Is this letter written during the time when Christopher was away during World War II? Exactly. Yes. It is written when he was overseas during the war. And Kate says, I like to think Frodo had some long sessions with Deanna. One would hope so, because she's the one who would understand. And he, she's the one with whom he would feel the greatest kinship. Let's hope he did. And let's hope that Tolkien did too. Guys, we're over our time. It's three minutes past. I want to thank you for a most rewarding class. You have exceeded my hopes for what I would have liked to see go on in this class. And I want to thank you all and say good night. If you enjoyed this seminar, please consider making a small donation to Signum University. Your gift will help us continue to make the seminar series and other great content available for free to the public. Just go to signumuniversity.org slash fund slash donate slash seminars. Thanks!